Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. Today, I want to discuss the major political decisions that were made during the sixth and supposedly final season of The Expanse. For whatever you thought of the final season, it did have a really compelling political dynamic at play, and so I'm a lot more excited to examine the politics of the show than I was to cover the character arcs as I did last week. But before we get into looking at the decision making of the characters, we need to understand how the events of the season fit into the context of preceding and ongoing happenings in the Soul System. First, Marco Inaros' Free Navy has been continually bombarding the Earth's surface with targeted asteroids. We never really get a ground level view of the devastation these impacts have caused, but inferring from some things the characters say, the Earth has sustained tremendous damage to its biosphere, and its people are living in fear. And worse, they're facing food shortages and suffering mass casualties from the asteroid impacts and the aforementioned problems they entail. And you can imagine that given such a state of terror that Earthers are living in, their animosity towards the belt is heightened, and they most likely are issuing widespread calls to their leaders to strike back. Now, in recent months, Earth is finally starting to get the attacks from above under control. Less people are dying, and most of the asteroids are being shot out of the air. However, Earth is paying a great cost in terms of military resources in order to defend itself. Earth's navy is otherwise occupied fending off massive space rocks, and so it cannot allocate the requisite ships to mount a counterattack. Thus, Earth's leaders, namely Christian of Asarala, are under intense pressure to get the whole Marco Inaro's problem solved before he weakens his enemies enough to operate from a position of power over the realm of Inyaloda. And things aren't getting any easier in that regard because as Inaros assaults the Earth on one hand, on another he's gaining tributaries around the system. Thus, Earth and Mars have formed a coalition known as the EMC, which is aimed at taking down the Free Navy. And its first objective is to build more vessels, which at the moment, it hasn't completed yet. Therefore, Belter leader Kamina Drummer and her crew aboard the Tynan, and Captain James Holden and his Rossi family, still must serve as the workhorses in this fight. Okay, so this is where the conflict in Season 6 starts us off. It's a hell of a complex situation that involves many different factions, but fundamentally speaking, it pits two decision makers against one another in a veritable chess match. UN Secretary General, the Deep State Mamacita, Christian of Vassarala, and Commander of the Belter Free Navy, an extremist military arm of the Outer Planets Alliance, Marco Inaros. And the decisions these two actors and their loyal operatives and allies make will prove to decide the fate of mankind in the Soul System, and via the Ring Gate, perhaps beyond. What exacerbates the conflict is that both the Vasarala and Denaros are operating on premises they find, and perhaps fairly, to be undeniable. Avasarala is working on the premise, as she tells both Monica Stewart and Holden during the course of the show, that Marco Inaros cannot be reasoned with. The only thing Marco Inaros has to offer me is his unconditional surrender. He isn't going to negotiate a truce in good faith. He must either be defeated in combat or made to surrender unconditionally. Marco then is working on the premise that he must accomplish two things at all costs, lest he will fail. One, he must procure goods from around the belt in order to stock Medina Station with the sufficient resources to be self-sustainable for a long time. This is mostly why Anaros is so interested in Siri Station, a major trade port in the belt. It has the mother load of goods, even if the lion's share of goods don't always find their way into the hands of the belters who make up the majority of inhabitants of Ceres. After amassing the requisite resources, the second thing Marco believes he must do is get to Medina Station in the ring space, without being annihilated by the EMC, that is. Considering this second objective, by the way, just think how arrogant it is that along the course of the events in Season 6, he decides to take a detour in order to try and take down the Rasanante. But I digress. Now, desperate as she is to start things off, Avasarala first tries to use the media, specifically reporter Monica Stewart, to expose the human toll of Marco's attacks on the Earth to Belters in the hopes that doing so will leave Belters aghast at Marco's actions and even find them feeling some level of culpability for their Earther brethren. And in turn, Belters will then turn on Marco and refuse to provide him support. 
Of course, the problems with this plan and the reason it can't produce a significant change sans other more aggressive policies are many, including that belters aren't going to readily believe news produced by Earthers, and also that many belters are experiencing joyful sentiments of vengeance in thinking that Earth is experiencing a taste of the suffering that the belt has endured for ages. Now murders know what it feels like to be belter. Nonetheless, Avasarala employs this strategy, which is one that requires a potent optimism in humanity to succeed, and initial reports are that Monica's reporting is having positive results. It's hard to say how accurate such reports are without having a look at them myself, but supposedly broadcasting the Earther's plight has elicited some sympathy from certain factions of the belt under Marco's flag. At her own discretion, Monica then gets a bit bolder. She decides to put a face to the belters on Siri Station as well. People who are also suffering, though due to the actions of Marco Anaros, Earth, and Mars alike. Though Avasarala isn't thrilled with Monica's decision here when she first finds out about it, thinking it will make the Earth look weak as its government can't get the station under control following Marco's subterfuge, I personally think this is a much more sensible plan of action. As while belters are still going to have problems with the reporter's UN-associated credentials, they're much more likely to be moved to apoplexy at the sight of the plight of their own people than they are to be moved to guilt at the sight of Earther struggles, and Avasarala should have asked Monica to cover the suffering of belters in the first place. Now unfortunately, because it's impossible to control for various events, we can't know for sure, but at least according to the UN, Monica's report on Ceres at least seems to have the effect of spurring a portion of the population of the belt against Marco. To be honest, I'm skeptical that Monica Stewart's reporting has much to do with turning the tide in the conflict. She sort of reminds me of a journalist who thinks that the whole world is what's happening on Twitter. She has some effects on events in the system, but is just one reporter putting out stories among an endless stream of news. However, if successful, the reporting is certainly bolstered by Marco's false flag attack on Ceres, an attack which forces Avasarala to think about strategies beyond building media narratives that convey the depravity of Marco and Naros to the belt. Marco Anaros takes off with his crew and leaves Ceres behind, having stripped it of its resources, and thus leaves it worse off than it was when he arrived there. Now, Rosenfeld makes mention of Ceres simply not being an important tactical point of interest to the Free Navy, and explains that they can leave it behind with little care, as they've gotten what they need from it. Our presence on Ceres has rallied countless belters to the cause. Well, then it served its purpose. We owe these people. Nothing. And given Marco's plan to hold fort in the ring space at Medina Station, this is mostly true. However, I think an even more honest explanation of why Marco abandoned Ceres is that, and if I recall correctly, he does acknowledge this, they simply can't hold Ceres forever. This is the very reason they have to get to the ring space. The dynamics of this extra dimensional area and Medina Station within it can afford the Free Navy a position from which they can fend off the prodigious forces of the EMC into perpetuity even after the EMC has expanded its fleet. So my analysis here is that despite Philip's noble preference for attending to the needs of the people of Ceres, his father Marco simply cannot. If they stick around or leave them their resources, their plans will likely falter. However, does Marco need to detonate explosives all over the station after they depart? Well, that's a separate question. The Free Navy, led by Marco's rousing speeches, has wooed hordes of supporters to their side during their time on Ceres. And of course, Marco ideally wants to retain these supporters even while abandoning them. You know, the whole have your cake and eat it too thing. So one might think that destroying more of their habitat and wasting much of their water resources in doing so wouldn't help to advance that cause. Marco seems to have taken a big risk by making this decision. If he's caught, he could lose more than just the support of Belters on Ceres. But Marco is desperate to find a way to slow the Earth-Mars coalition down, and initiating a major humanitarian crisis on Ceres as the EMC's forces arrive there seems like a pretty clever way to do so. The attack both draws the suspicions of the Belters on Ceres towards the EMC, and leaves the EMC to clean up the place, and thus expend time and resources in doing so. So despite seeming like an unhinged move, it makes some sense. Marco does not have the force to confront the EMC in a conventional void war. And so the belters of Ceres become a necessary sacrifice. Additionally, Marco knows that as a godlike figure, 
he can get away with a lot before his people will turn on him. This is very much akin to the thinking of former President Donald Trump when he said, where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. Marco knows his people are not going to abandon him easily, and on the contrary, he can abuse them a lot with little consequence. And as we know, while the Belters on Ceres are probably not aware that Marco detonated the explosives, they already know that he took their resources and left. Inaris abandoned you. I chose to remain here to limit the damage your illegitimate occupation will do. But everything that could be of use to your troops has been stripped. And inferring from local Belter leader Sandrani's words, they're happy to let him have the goods, or at least Marco has convinced them that they should be happy to let him have the goods so that the inners can't use them for their own benefit instead. It's quite easy to pity these earnest Belters who hold sincere grievances against Earth and Mars and only want a better life. However, this all said, what Marco fails to account for is that many of the Free Navy's territories, especially the newly absorbed ones, weren't that loyal to Marco in the first place, and only begrudgingly join his cause to avoid any retaliation. And on top of that, many of the civilians in the Free Navy's expanding territories are not even Belters, so their allegiances are more easily swayed. His abandonment of Ceres might be a step too far for the peripheral constituents of the Free Navy, albeit one Marco can't avoid. And thus, we see news reports on the Pella that show belters in some Free Navy jurisdictions beginning to protest against Marco for his presumed cowardice in leaving Ceres to fend for itself. So what should the EMC do now that they're stuck with this dilemma on Ceres? Do they stay and deliver aid to the people, or do they take off and concern themselves with Marco and Naros before he gets to the safety of the ring space? Remember, the Earthers are not working from a position of riches at this moment. Their planet's surface has been scorched, and the people there are in dire straits themselves when it comes to resources. As one of Avasarala's subordinates informs her, the EMC cannot provide enough aid to competently care for the inhabitants of Ceres. There's no way we can feed and supply a million people on three weeks' notice. Our lines are already overstretched. Of course, this is a bit of straw man argumentation because some aid is better than none. I think what's really going on here is that many Earthers are simply loath to help Belters when the people of Earth are suffering because of Belter actions, and when there are more pressing matters to attend to. It's not a great look for the EMC to be aiding Ceres when Earth needs the aid just as much, no matter how adeptly Monica Stewart is able to humanize the Belters through her reporting. And yet, Avasarala decides they must do what they can for the Belters anyway. She doesn't just advocate for staying at Ceres to be nice, either. If we don't help this station, we will be the ones responsible for a massive humanitarian crisis. The Belt will see us once again as the oppressor. No, rather, she's acutely aware of the EMC's need to win the favor of some portion of the Belt if they're going to have any chance of overcoming Inaros, without having to undertake a protracted and costly full-scale war. And thanks to Monica Stewart's reporting, they're just beginning to make some headway in winning the hearts and minds of Belters. If they abandon Ceres now, Earth and Mars can forever forget the notion of making allies in Belters who are loyal to Marco and Naros. This is one of the things, one of the many things, I love about Avasarala. She doesn't waste time mulling over the trap that the EMC has walked into on Ceres. She doesn't even attempt to try and prove that Marco is the one who planted the explosives. She just accepts the circumstance and immediately reconfigures her plans to include aiding the Belters. Inaris knew we needed this port to repair and refuel and stage for Jupiter and Saturn, and he turned it into a trap. And we're in it now. She's amended or perhaps revealed more of her fundamental premise here. She must win allies in the belt away from Marco. She must. And her basis for believing this is possible is that she's seen the same thing that Philip sees on the Pella. That civilians in the Free Navy's territories are turning on Marco. Avasarala is far from being a clueless member of the elite who is given to sententious rhetoric for the sake of affirming her own virtue to the public. She's simply very aware of the sensitivity of the situation she's dealing with vis-a-vis -vis the belt, and knows she must handle it with absolute care if she's going to achieve her goal of gaining belter support. 
You'll recall that when the EMC is just descending on Ceres, she orders that no belters are to be taken in for questioning without her prior authorization. No one is to be taken in for questioning without my authorization. The last thing we need is to be seen rounding up belters like Kata. Why? because she's mindful of the optics that rounding up belters would entail. So despite of Vasarala's apparent nascent softness, she's still good old of Vasarala, carefully carrying out her masterful plans. By the way, just as an aside, I believe James Holden shares with Avasarala an awareness of the delicate nature of the EMC's budding relationship with ambivalent belters who are unsure who to share their loyalties with. As you know, he disengages a torpedo launched from the Rossi at the Pella, a missile which, if left active, seems sure to make impact and destroy its target. And he later confesses to Naomi that the reason he chose to do so is that he didn't want to kill her son, who was aboard the Pella with his father. Now, if this is the only reason he chooses to disarm the torpedo, well, he's remarkably irresponsible and should not hold the helm of such an important vessel. However, me thinks the better part of the reason he disarms the torpedo is that if Marco dies a hero without ever having been exposed as a fraud, the belt will turn him into a martyr and rise up in his name. The death of Marco and Naros at this point in the conflict would be but a peric and rather short-lived victory. It's not hard to imagine that, should Marco and Naros fall, that the belt has other zealots just like him who can rise in his stead. I suppose that sometimes winning war is not just about killing your enemy, but killing your enemy at the right time. Back to Avasarala's pursuit of Belter favor, though. Just incidentally, something very important happens after the Crisis on Ceres that comes to sway the favor of Belters away from Marco Inaros, much more than Monica Stewart's reporting ever does. You stole from your own. You abandoned Ceres to the inner and left Belters to stop. You called yourself a champion and then you ran. Kamina Drummer gets on the airwaves, or rather, the void waves, and broadcasts a message throughout the system in which she demonstrates proof that Marco is stealing and hoarding Belter resources for his own benefit, and lambastes him for his cowardice in abandoning Ceres. Belters aren't going to readily buy an anti-Marco Inaro's narrative coming from a UN channel, but they'll listen to one coming from an equally revered figure in the belt, and Kamina Drummer fits that mold. And I would assume that those territories which are reluctantly falling under Marcos's control are much more in line with Drummer, philosophically speaking. This broadcast from Drummer, in my view, is the turning point in Belter support for Marco and Naros. And Avasarala now realizes that she's got to forget her newsmaking endeavor with Monica Stewart and get this Kamina Drummer on the line. Drummer can clearly be the UN's conduit into Belter hearts. Belters trust her. Some will flock to her, and some will abandon the Free Navy. That could make all the difference. This is just one more example of Avasarala knowing exactly what she needs to do, and then proceeding to go about doing it without hesitation. And then I love the move she makes next. She meets with Drummer in public view on Ceres. Here is the most powerful person, perhaps in the entire system, humbling herself and walking out into Belter territory to negotiate terms of partnership with a Belter leader, eye to eye, and with complete transparency. Sure, some Belters will simply resolve their ensuing moral dilemmas by accusing Drummer of being a puppet of the Inners, but many others are going to see the image of Avasarala treating Drummer as a peer and asking for her help, all in the context of Inaros having run from Ceres, and be hard-pressed to find a reason to continue with their allegiance to the self-proclaimed Knife in the Darkness. So Avasarala has applied Monica Stewart's advice on a personal level. If you want the enemy to see you as human, you have to see them as human. I'm not sure Belters will ever do that. I'm not sure I'm talking about them. She's humanizing herself to the Belters and seeing for herself the suffering of the Belters. And this is a very moving moment for all. Avasarala, from the start of season six, has been trying and trying to get something on camera that changes the dynamic of the major political conflict taking place in the Soul System. She tries a few different things with Monica Stewart to varying degrees of success, but here she finally gets what she's looking for. A broadcast of her shaking hands with the belt most trusted leader on the surface of Ceres. This moment, disseminated throughout the system, thus empowers the peoples in territories around the belt to rise up against Marco's rule. 
What Marco Inaro sees as a trap he's led the Inners into, a Vasarala sees as an opportunity to win the loyalties of the Bells. And so to her, the most important point of interest is right there on Ceres itself, not wherever Marco Inaros is on the Pella. Marco Inaros now realizes he's in trouble. He's absent from view while Drummer is on the ground caring for Belters. However, this isn't a problem he hasn't foreseen. It's just that its occurrence is a sign that he now needs to hightail it to Medina Station, where he and his followers can hunker down behind the safety of the massive railguns he has mechanically strapped to the ring station, ready to obliterate all intruders in the ring space. So this is the point at which the conflict between the EMC and the Free Navy becomes a simple race to the ring gate. And this is also where Avasarala does make a bit of a mistake. She tries to get too much out of Ceres. She stays there too long, even when UN and Martian officials are pressuring her to mobilize their warships and head to confront Marco Inaros before he's able to reach the security of Medina Station. There is still time to intercept them, but the window's closing fast. We have to mobilize now. Abandon Ceres and consign every soul upon it to starvation and death. Yes, she needs to win allies in the belt, but I think here she forgets moderation. And she also shouldn't expect to be able to wait until the EMC can sufficiently build up its forces before engaging the Free Navy. Time is an issue, and so she can't wait for the perfect circumstances, and I think she's a little guilty of doing this. Perhaps in part not just because she doesn't understand the gravity of the situation, there's none after all, but because as she worries, she's become a bit soft and wants to tend to the people of Ceres, and also is not eager to greenlight another war. Have I gone soft? Was I trying too hard to be good when I should have been ruthless? You used your best judgment. And lost. But she must relent at this point, because they have to intercept the Free Navy before it enters the ring space, lest Marco Inaro should control the fate of mankind. She ultimately comes to understand this, and thus mobilizes the UN's fleet towards the ring space, but perhaps the final battle would have been a little less suspenseful had she ordered the mobilization earlier, and the fleet caught up to Inaros before he got anywhere close to the ring gate. Of course, James Holden and co. still pull off a victory with a death-defying display of flying and badass space marinery to coin a term. I think in retrospect, along with Avasarala's successful attempt to win a courtship with the Belters, Marco Inaros himself makes two significantly poor decisions, which ultimately lead the Free Navy to its doom. First, while he maybe can't avoid retreating into the ring space, he puts too much faith in Admiral Duarte, the apparent leader of the Martians who defected to the Laconia system. Duarte is not a belter, and thus not obliged to help Marco Inaros, aside from when doing so helps him. Inaros seems to expect that Duarte will provide every measure of support necessary to help the Free Navy defeat the EMC, especially in terms of arms. You're expecting something more from Duarte? Well, you know how much I like surprises. But if he was wiser, he would not expect that Duarte would put valuable assets at stake in order to save some belters. It's almost like Inaros has an overly optimistic view of Duarte, which is surprising given his own predilection for duplicity and evil doing. Nonetheless, Inaros rests the fate of his forces on receiving last minute support from a nominal ally. At best, this is a bad decision. You were a useful distraction, but I have gods to kill. The ring to Laconia is now closed. You're on your own. Second, Inaros makes the mistake of perceiving the EMC as a singular force, when in fact, it's made up of the separate and still mostly independent forces of Mars and Earth. It's in no way a fully unified force. You'll recall that when Mars first requests support from the UN in assembling a strike force to attack the Free Navy at the ring space, a Vasarala declines. Rushing headlong to solve our pride and prove our manhood is exactly what Inaris wants. I will not commit my forces to that plan. And what does the Martian Navy do? They simply go it alone and head for the ring space without the aid of the UN. Now, what's weird is that Marco does anticipate that Mars will employ a separate and divergent strategy from Earth in response to his abandonment of Ceres. I told you they would split their forces. You still don't like the odds. Not my kind of fight. 
this battle was inevitable. And yet, for whatever reason, it doesn't seem like he properly plans to confront the two forces on different fronts. Perhaps he just knows he can't. The UN forces thus tend to the people of Ceres while a Martian strike force approaches the ring space, and in effect, the EMC covers all its bases, playing both offense and defense at once and accidentally, well, perhaps accidentally, implementing a sort of good cop, bad cop dynamic that actually seems to be the strategy by which the EMC best functions. Now, the MCRN strike force gets destroyed upon arrival at the ring space, but not before its ships are able to do some worthwhile scouting of the Free Navy's railguns. The UN ships are then able to approach the ring gate with a better knowledge of what lies beyond it. Marco Inaro should have developed separate plans for dealing with Mars and Earth, but he does not. Though I suppose he's a bit of a tragic villain from the start. His megalomaniacal ambitions are a bit too lofty to be attainable for an extremist like himself. It could be that the only way for him to win would be for him to moderate his position, and that kind of negates the point of his mission in the first place. On the other hand, while the EMC faces a few bumps along the way, Avasarala rather competently and efficiently deals with what is an existential crisis for humanity, or at least for inners. Rather than let Marco Inaros frustrate her, she sort of goes with the flow, accepts problems as they come at her, and handles them without becoming reactionary, until she's able to fully understand what she needs to do to win, sort of like a boxer absorbing punches in a defensive stance until he spots an opening on his opponent. When Avasarala sees that opening, she strikes with a forceful and smart enough attack to fail the Free Navy. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. It might be the last Expanse video. I do for a while. I hope not, though. Uh, do give it a big thumbs up if you did enjoy it. Comment down below. Really excited to hear your thoughts on this one. Remember to subscribe to this channel and hit that damn notification bell so you don't miss a damn thing. For now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.